The Charlotte Bobcats have been away from the NBA for five seasons, but it feels like they've been gone even longer. Probably because the NBA, the Hornets, and the entire state of North Carolina want you to forget about them. Kind of like Eddie Murphy in The Adventures of Pluto Nash. At no point in time was there any indication that either could be good or, hell, even respectable. Yet the powers that be pushed along, and in the process, created dumpster fires that burned so bright that those watching questioned if it was even real. Both were also led by black guys with mustaches way out of their depth. But when something's that terrible, it's important to keep the memory alive. So, let's honor the Bobcats' 15th anniversary by chronicling the complete disaster of a team they were. During his civil trial for allegedly kidnapping and sexually assaulting a woman, Charlotte Hornets owner George Shin thought it'd be a good idea to ask the people of Charlotte to rev up a new arena for the team. Voters promptly told him to fuck off, giving the Hornets two options for a new stadium sell the team to new ownership, or leave. Fearing backlash from the other owners if they forced to sell, the NBA approved the Hornets' move to New Orleans, proving that being a billionaire is a fraternity and that both are totally cool with their members possibly being sexual abusers. Upon learning of the move, the city of Charlotte said, wait, we don't want to support an owner accused of sex crimes and our reward for having morals is that we lose our team? The NBA realizes this is kind of a bad look, aka it'll lose them a lot of money. So, as part of the relocation agreement, they add a clause that guarantees that Charlotte will be home to the 30th NBA franchise. Look at that! A new team, new ownership, a new identity for a city already described as basketball crazy? This couldn't get any better. And that ended up being correct. It never got better. Two groups emerged in the battle for the unnamed franchise. The first was led by all-time NBA great Larry Bird, as well as Boston billionaire Steve Belkin. They didn't win the bid, but went on to be successful executives elsewhere. Bird resided over numerous Pacers playoff teams, and Steve Belkin was bought out of the Hawks for being smart enough not to trade for Joe Johnson. But what buyer could be more qualified for NBA ownership than Larry Bird? Who was so powerful that the NBA was forced to shun a man who was the face of their league for a decade? Ro Robert Johnson, the not 420 friendly creator of BET. Nelly's coming too? Oh, that's cool because it's 2003. Now with ownership locked in, it's time to create a team. Charlotte was not restricted by the soulless options of NBA 2K, so the possibilities were endless. Two potential names tested especially well. First, the flight, a reference to the city's history of aviation, which has the added benefit of referencing the high-flying athleticism synonymous with the NBA. Second was the Dragons. The OG Hornets established strong branding in the 90s with a cartoon logo and a wild color scheme. Naming the team the Dragons would give the franchise a similar canvas to work with. So, which will it be? So you I named missed. the team after yourself? Being an owner is a vanity project on its own, but to force the team to bear your name is the act of an insane person. Are we sure that BET doesn't stand for Bob Entertainment Television? Seriously, thank God Johnson's first name isn't Thomas, otherwise Charlotte would have welcomed the tank engines to the city. In retrospect, the amateur sounding Bobcats was fitting, however, because they played like a high school team for most of their existence. Leading up to the 2004 draft, the Bobcats traded their number four pick with the Clippers in exchange for a bad contract in the number two. They used this pick to draft assumed franchise cornerstone Emeka Okafor. Okafor would proceed to inexplicably win Rookie of the Year over Dwight Howard despite being worse in nearly every conceivable way, and would become the mascot of the franchise's mediocrity on the court and in the draft for years to come. They finished their first season a bad but not out of the ordinary for an expansion team 18 and 64, which is the same record as the New Orleans Hornets. This is important for the offseason. The 2005 draft lottery puts the Hornets fourth and the Bobcats fifth. The Bobcats also have the 13th pick. The internet doesn't say with whom, but the Bobcats have an opportunity to move up in the draft, all but guaranteeing them Wake Forest point guard and former North Carolina Mr. Basketball Chris Paul. This is a dream pairing for a franchise searching for an identity and a cornerstone guard to pair with their not yet total disappointment Emeka Okafor. They pulled the trigger. Oh, not on the trade in Chris Paul, but on secondary Carolina product and human penguin Raymond Felton and... Sean May? 
They didn't take the trade and instead double dip on UNC prospects who both had uncertainties about their game translating to the pros. I mean, I get they won a championship at UNC and hindsight is 2020, but you drafted an overweight forward and a point guard who couldn't shoot who also became overweight over Chris Paul. How'd that work out? The Bobcats still suck. No surprise there. The real news is that Michael freaking Jordan bought a stake in the franchise and he's the new president of basketball operations. The GOAT has returned to the association to establish a winning culture and bully draft picks to tears once again. Missing out on Larry Bird was totally worth it for this. Okay, MJ, what's our first move? With the third pick in the 2006 NBA draft, the Charlotte Bobcats select Adam Morrison from Gonzaga University. You what? A known head case with a slew of health problems and next to zero athleticism? You already have a small forward in Gerald Wallace. What in God's name are you thinking? Morrison, AKA the incel baller, would fizzle out of the league after just four seasons. He's the only player taken in the top eight that year to start less than 100 games. If you're the biggest bust, in a draft class with Andrea Bargnani, Tyrus Thomas, and Sheldon Williams, you're a special kind of terrible. What was MJ thinking? Well, whatever it was, he keeps thinking it. The Bobcats suck again, albeit a little less. Regardless, that offseason, they fire Colin Powell, I mean Bernie Bickerstaff, bring in literally some guy, and draft another UNC alum with major questions. No matter, they trade right for Jason Richardson. What the fuck is this roster? The most used starting five that season consisted of Raymond Felton, Jeff McInnes, Jason Richardson, Gerald Wallace, and Emeka Okafor. Small ball may be effective now, but it certainly wasn't in 2007. And it's especially ineffective when only one guy in the starting lineup can shoot. Most games were spent watching Gerald Wallace getting destroyed in the paint, Felton and McInnes breaking every shot they put up, while Jason Richardson had full reign to hero ball them to a 32 win season. This roster was so bad and so confusingly assembled, the team forgot to put McGinnis on the official roster before he debuted. Head coach and literally some guy Sam Vincent is fired after just one season. In turn, the Bobcats bring in proven winner Larry Brown. He ensures the team has an actual feasible lineup by trading away Jay Rich for Boris Diaw and Raja Bell. The team goes nowhere. Morrison and May return from injuries, do nothing, and get benched. Morrison was shipped to LA mid-season, and May's option wasn't even picked up at its conclusion. As the franchise marches towards nowhere, one can't help but wonder if the Bobcats will ever be anything but trash. Leading up to becoming the majority owner of the Bobcats, Michael Jordan begins some major roster upheaval. First ever draft pick, Emeka Okafor, is shipped away to, funny enough, New Orleans for defensive stalwart Tyson Chandler. A few weeks into the season, they acquire Steven Jackson. This Frankenstein roster is actually good enough for a playoff spot. Huh, son of a bitch, they actually did it. Albeit a seven seed, but still anything can happen in the playoffs. Let's see what this roster can do, and they get swept by the magic. You also get your only all-star in franchise history with Gerald Wallace. Congrats, I guess. Despite trading away Tyson Chandler and losing Raymond Felton, the Bobcats hope to make the playoffs for the second year in a row. They get off to a terrible start, and Larry Brown steps down as a Christmas present to himself. Franchise legend Gerald Wallace gets shipped to Portland for draft picks and scrubs in a total forfeit of a trade. Time to fuck up the draft again! Luckily for Charlotte, there aren't any questionable UNC prospects for MJ to reach on. They draft NCAA Tournament Most Outstanding Player Kemba Walker plus Tobias Harris. Nice! Looking at things now, that's a great tandem to build a winning franchise on and you trade Tobias, Steven Jackson, and Sean Livingston for Bismack Biombo. What is with this team and their obsession with garbage centers? Is Michael Jordan really that insecure about drafting Kwame Brown number one overall that he tries to make up for it every offseason? He can't feel that bad because Kwame started 50 games for them last season. An ominous sign of things to come. Well, we did it. We reached singularity. The combination of shit trades, bad drafts, and incompetent management have all fused perfectly to create a complete box office bomb of a team. This roster is so bad, it's a wonder the league didn't step in and have another expansion draft. 
To make matters worse, they were over the cap. The Bobcats lose their last 23 games to secure the worst winning percentage in NBA history. The league's been around for 66 years to this point. It took the Bobcats less than 10 to achieve the pinnacle of failure. Well, let's take a look at the men who made all this possible. DJ Augustine is technically a point guard. Gerald Henderson has a breakout season and that the team could either let him shoot or throw Jordan's now 50-year-old ass on the court. They may have fared better doing the latter. Corey Maggette is old and manages just 32 games before he's out for the season. They paid him $10 million. Adam Morrison has fused with Shrek to become the ogre that is Byron Mullins. Look at him and tell me there's a god! He, Bismack Biombo, and DiGiorno Pizza Jop form the holy triumvirate of absolute dog piss centers. Not one player on the whole team shoots above league average. Oh, Matt Carroll's still here. Hey, Matt. My brain hurts looking at this team. The Sixers tried on purpose to be bad, and yet they couldn't be this bad. Who greenlit this project? How is anyone involved still working in the NBA? On the bright side, this should lead to a hard reboot since the number one pick is all but guaranteed. Never mind, David Stern rigged the lottery for Charlotte's ex-lover because they wouldn't let them trade away Chris Paul. Regardless of all that, number two overall is pretty damn good, and this is a solid draft. It should be a step in the right direction. Your team can't shoot. You draft a player who can't shoot. No, I don't mean a guy who is bad at shooting. I'm talking about a guy that cannot shoot a basketball properly. And this isn't a Markel Fultz situation where his jump shot just vanished because of an injury. They knew this guy couldn't shoot, and they still took him. How did no one see this coming? If my parents saw me shooting a ball like that in fourth grade, I'd be running suicides until high school graduation. I don't care if he's an okay defensive role player. I'm not paying a guy $13 million a year to effectively play four and five when I have the ball, especially in the modern NBA. He doesn't appear in the top 15 in win shares per 48, BPM, or VORP for this draft class. The dude is a stone cold bust. When you have draft capital year after year and you continuously fuck it up, your organization is rotten to the core. How can a franchise make mistake after mistake when they have opportunities every year? Do you know what? Fuck this. I'm done. It's, it's, this is too bad. I, I didn't walk away from Pluto Nash. I'm not making the same mistake twice. <laughs> Okay, there's only a couple more seasons to suffer through, so I guess I'll just finish this thing off. What happens in the next season? Oh, they still suck? No way. Who would have thought that starting Ramon Sessions was a bad idea? His name sounds like he could be the made-up protagonist in the 2K My Player mode. Kemba Walker is the only draft pick in the entire history of the Bobcats who doesn't look like a complete bust, so that's nice. And of course, wouldn't be the Bobcats without adding a trash center, so Brendan Haywood joins the fight. Oh, Matt Carroll's still here? Hey, Matt, never mind. They miss being the worst team in the NBA by a game. In May of 2013, Michael Jordan announces the official mercy killing of the Bobcats. After the upcoming season, they'll switch back to the Hornets after the Toucan Sams surrendered rights to the name. The Bobcats have one last shot to be anything but awful. They meet their trash center quota early by drafting Cody Zeller, so good luck with that. Free agency rolls around and they actually get Al Jefferson. That's pretty good. And pretty good the season was. The Bobcats in their last season actually resembled a professional basketball team. They maintained the same starting lineup most of the year and win 44 games. Al Jefferson goes sicko mode in the second half and carries the team to the playoffs. I mean, it's the last year of the team's existence and they're in the playoffs where anything can happen and they get swept by LeBron. And that's it. The Bobcats were no more after fittingly getting thrashed by an actually successful expansion team. They lasted 10 seasons, ending with the worst winning percentage in NBA history, never winning a playoff game, and despite this, never having the number one overall pick. Their legacy is that of a revolving door of head coaches, terrible roster management, and making us question if the nuclear fallout from the Looney Tunes land finally corrupted Michael Jordan's brain. The degree to which the Bobcats failed wasn't surprising, but looking back on their history, you almost can't believe it was real. This happened. Not as a prank, not on purpose. The Bobcats were legitimately just this awful.